Hello everyone, welcome. This is the A Musia podcast. It's a podcast for music nerds. I'm Tom. I'm Blake. Yes, hello. Right, uh, today's episode, Blake. Yes. We are looking at some bark. Or should it be pronounced Bach? Um, I'm not going to. Okay. Because you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I and, do. I'm just being a pen. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do that. Like, oh, well, Bach. It just sounds like coughing up phlegm or something. Is that better? I think it's because the CH as in lock, isn't it? Hmm. I'm just saying bark. Okay. Sorry if that's not actually correct, but you know who I'm talking about. Um, so this episode is going to be mostly for either composers or people just generally interested in the compositional process. Sure. Uh, we're going to have a look at just a few devices that bark uses. Yeah. Like, they, things that just appear commonly throughout his uh, repertoire. So I'm not saying this is in any way like an exhaustive, uh, you know, comprehensive analysis of Bach's music because that's not going to fit in 40 minutes or whatever. <laughs> uh, who knows how many hours that would be. I'm uh, just looking at a few different devices that they're just useful to know. I like the analogy, like a, a composer's toolbox, just things you have in your mind. Where it's like, if you're writing a piece of music, you think, hmm, yeah, I could just do that. So that do you work. think they're still relevant? Yeah. Well, I hope so, because I use some of them. <laughs> okay. And um, yeah, that's, I think that's one of the reason, one of the reasons Bach still is revered as probably one of the best musicians ever. Like, was it, because he wasn't popular originally, was he? Was it Mendelssohn that made him popular? Or Yeah, about a hundred years after his death. Um, Mendelssohn, when he was about 18, but still very talented, because um, he was a real prodigy as a child, like a lot of the great composers are, he put on a performance of the St. Matthew Passion, okay. from which he conducted the entire, I think he conducted the entire thing from memory, from the piano. <laughs> wow. And uh, it's one of those things that a, um, you, know, you get the sort of authentic, you know, early music kind of snobs who are like, oh, it should be played just how it was written. I yeah. don't think Mendelssohn did that. I think it had the kind of romantic interpretation of the time. But people loved it. They went crazy for it, and it kind of revived him. Uh, he was more known amongst uh, composers. Like, all the great composers of the classical era knew his work and studied it. Like, uh, Mozart definitely did, because Mozart became friends with one of his sons, I think Johann Christian Bach. Okay. Um, when he was a child, he went on tour to London, and he met J.C. Bach there. He's often known as the London Bach because he spent so much time there. And I think some people think that he actually introduced Mozart to the piano because it wasn't wow. a particularly big thing at the time. It's uh, kind of they... incestuous. They all knew each other. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, yeah, Mozart was great friends with Haydn. Uh, they met. He met Beethoven once. Wow. When Beethoven was a child, he was sent to go study with Mozart. And uh, they had one lesson and then um, Beethoven's mother got really ill and he had to go back and then Mozart was dead basically quickly afterwards. Yeah. So they had one meeting, probably. <laughs> um, anyway, what were you talking about? So Bach is typically Baroque, isn't he? Yeah. And I read somewhere that cl classical music, you know, the classical era of music yeah. That's is- That's generally like from 1750 to like the 19th century. Yeah, uh, um, like followed eight. by romanticism. Yeah. Um, but the classical era is much more simplistic in terms of the harmonies, than yeah. the Baroque. Yeah, they did kind of uh, bring it back a little. It got a bit nursery rhyme. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> no, it was just more about structure in a way. And a lot of Baroque music is very complicated. If you look at like Baroque architecture, it kind of makes the point a bit more obvious. Okay, do you think there's a parallel there? Oh, very much, yeah. Uh, you look at buildings built in the 17th century and like how elaborate and ornate they are. It's like almost to the point of garish in a way. I mean, I like it, but you know what I mean? Some people might argue that. That's and then they kind of bring it back a little. Well, because I'm just thinking about uh, minimalism and minimalism correlates with like brutalism in architecture. I don't know what brutalism is. I've never heard the term. Oh, the concrete buildings you see that with like sheer edges, oh, they're okay. very geometric. Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't know how far the parallels go there. It didn't go like minimalism, yeah. it's just, brought it back a little bit yeah they didn't just get rid of all this stuff um so do you think uh, baroque music is more driven by the composition itself and the compositional elements 
So perhaps this would be more noticeable. The composition from techniques you're talking about are more present, more obviously a feature of the music. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, it's really hard to come up with a completely satisfying definition of, um, or just a satisfying way of explaining Bach's music. Sometimes I think it's just so about the notes. I know that sounds a bit vague. Yeah, what, what was but... your theory of, uh, oh, um, entropy in music, but you did it in relation to Bach? <laughs> we could do a different episode about okay. that. I can't remember what I said exactly, right. so we're going to... Not, not let's not worry about that right now. We're just going to look at some devices. We haven't even got. We're going to look at three different things that uh, turn up quite a lot in his music, uh, and I've written some blogs on it. So I'm going to be just sort of reading the blogs, and you can chime in or ask something. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, because I don't know if it should be said, but I'm traditionally I'm more of a jazz musician so this is kind of unfamiliar territory to me mm. whereas you are very much a classical guitarist yeah um I think these sort of things sh they relate to any kind of style though that's why I think they're useful okay. because we're looking at I mean these are specific things but there's a kind of more meta point we're going to get to at the end about composition looking in general forward to it okay so the first specific example of a device we're looking at here is that Bach sets up a descending melodic sequence, which then lands on an unexpected chromatic note. And okay. that's quite a mouthful for like yeah. a device. But uh, so we talk about melodic sequence. This is a, another thing that's very common in like Baroque and classical music, especially instrumental stuff. Um, like a good example would be uh, Bach's Prelude in C. I just have my guitar here. It's just easy just, if I just, just sit. Lying around. Like, yeah. It's like, uh, when I'm to get it, but, you know. <laughs> like, you can hear that there's a pattern there. Yeah. And then that follows on into all the other chords. So is that not an arpeggio? Yeah, that is, but it's not all sequences will be arpeggios. Okay. But like, so that, that almost the whole tune is based on this sequence of an ascending five notes going down and then up another three. That's like yeah. almost the whole piece. That's not the one we're looking at right now okay. but just for an example of what i mean by like a melodic sequence there's like a, a pattern but then the notes within the pattern will change but it's sort of continued on like that so Does that make sense would you say it's kind of an ostinato but just with a just well, it's almost like a, it's almost like an ostinato uh in spirit okay <laughs> sure uh yeah i don't know if i would have called it that it's just there is a pattern the pattern paint the pattern changes in its specifics, but the pattern remains kind of the same throughout. Yeah. And you get this a lot, not just classical, but much later, even more modern music, um, especially with guitars as well, because you get patterns that fit nicely under your hand, and then you can change the chords, yeah. but you can just keep this pattern going. It's a good way of kind of anchoring the listener to something, and then the music can change and they can go along with it. Like yeah, music. so that's more emergent, I guess, from guitar playing and instrumentality in guitar, yeah. whereas this was intentional for... The... Yeah, this is not in any way relating to the instrument. This is yeah. It's just because it works nicely as a compositional uh, device. Sure. It just goes nicely, I think, with our psychology. There is repetition and variation. Yeah. Important. That's something we're getting to more. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Uh... I'll use an example. There's one I use in the blog here. It's from Prelude BWV999. Catchy name. Yeah. He didn't call it that. His work's been catalogued and they've given BWV numbers. There, there must be yeah, a thousand had... or something of them, mustn't there? Yeah, it's more like yeah, 1,100 and something. Yeah, it's over a thousand. Uh, like Mozart has K numbers. That was, I think, the name of the guy who did the catalog, Kirchel, I think. Yeah, he just yeah. had to put his name in. Yeah. <laughs> this is Mozart's. Piece found by Kirchhoff. <laughs> I'm probably pronouncing that name wrong as well. Yeah. Also, like uh, astronomy, you get M numbers because that's from the name of the catalogue, Messier. Oh, okay. Maybe M31 Galaxy because it was a Messier's catalogue, number 31. Sure. He didn't know it was a galaxy at the time. Anyway, doesn't matter. But this is BWV 999. The BWV, by the way, uh, is German. It's Bach Werk Versiegnis. I have no idea how to pronounce that. It apparently just means work catalogue. Okay. Um, apparently that comes from the 50s, those those 
that catalog system. Okay. Uh, it was originally, this piece, 999, it was originally in C minor and is written for a rather preposterous looking instrument called the lute harpsichord, apparently. Yeah, I've got a picture here. Yeah, you're looking at that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll show that. Um, it does look pretty nuts. It's just a massive lute body, but with keys at the end. Has it got a harpsichord sound? It's sort of a bit of both. I'll put a link to it in the in the video so you can see, hear someone playing it. You know, lutes, they have that kind of almost like a round sound. Maybe I'm projecting because the body's round. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a kind of roundness to the sound. Sure, yeah. Like a softness. Okay. But I'm generally talking about it in D minor, not in the original key of C minor, because it's more well known as a guitar arrangement and D minor works much better for guitar than C minor. Yeah, fewer accidentals, which is nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's nice. But it's not just to do with the accidentals, it's because of the way the strings are tuned. Because in D minor, there's only one string on the guitar, the B, which isn't in that key. So you can utilize the open strings a lot more. Okay. Uh, but even something like um, E major, that has four sharps. But it works nicely on the guitar just because of the tuning. Yeah. Because all, I mean, you do have to, not all the open strings work, but lots of them do, and it just works nicely. Okay. So the whole piece is based around uh, a repeating arpeggio pattern in 3-4. Uh, it begins with this, uh, basically, like just establishing the key. Um, even though he moves through chords, um, I'm trying to look what they are now. Oh, can't see. Anyway, uh, it's, it's another thing he does quite a lot. He introduces maybe like a one four five pattern, but he keeps a drone of the tonic underneath at I the beginning. Yeah, he, yeah, it's, it's how the uh, cello suite in G begins. So it goes through different chords, and he but just keeps that G as a pedal. So interesting. So if he's got a five chord over a pedal of the tonic. Mm. So it's technically almost a sus four. Yeah, but then they're not played simultaneously. It's played as a pattern, but okay. yeah. But it is like that in principle. Okay, and then after this opening pattern, uh, he goes into, it's a, it's a D minor arpeggio, but there's a, a melodic sequence basically in the bass that goes down every bar, but the arpeggio stays the same. Yep. Um, okay, I can just show you, I'll just play you oh, what so I mean, because it's just a bit easier. Even if I don't play it too well, it doesn't matter, but... So you can hear, you can hear that. So every reiteration of the sequence, the melody line in the bass part descends diatonically interesting okay so that's basically setting up a pattern and it's like something you can anticipate where's it going yeah but this is what i'm getting at he sets up patterns for you to anticipate and then changes them this, this is what i'm getting at yeah so that's in d minor and um, so those bass notes went from uh it went down to c to b flat uh to an a so these are all in the key and then you'll be thinking oh g natural Maybe go to a G minor chord or something like the, the four chord in in D minor, something yeah. that you know. Yeah. But it's not what he does. So he lands on this unexpected chromatic note in this descending pattern. He lands on a G sharp, okay. so it's outside of the key. Yeah. Could, could that be a two chord? Could that be an E seven? It is. That's that's what I'm saying here. Um, well, I wrote in my blog that the G sharp is the major third of an E dominant seven flat nine chord. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, I'll play it Why for you. Why do you okay. think that? Oh, I didn't actually play it for you. So just so you can hear how it sounds. That's a really juicy chord. Yeah. For... Well, yeah, this, this is what I'm uh, getting at. Well, I wrote in the blog that it's a G sharp, uh, th that it's the major third of this E7 chord, and it has an F at the top, so that's what I'm saying. It's a flat nine yeah, yeah. dominant chord. Someone argued with me. I say argued. He just, it wasn't argued, he just said. And the comment seems to have gone for some reason. I didn't delete it. I don't know why it's gone. It's not like, oh, God, criticize me. 
delete. Um, he was saying that he thinks it's actually just a G-sharp diminished chord. Uh, it kind of doesn't matter in this context, not just because they're very similar, but that an E does appear, but after two uh, repetitions of this. So it's hard to actually put a point in when it was the arpeggio completed. That makes sense. Oh, is it, so you, they think it's a G sharp diminished six or something. No, just a just a G sharp uh, diminished, like a seventh chord. Okay. Because G sharp, B, D, F. Okay, yeah. that, but you, you're saying there, there's an E in there as well. Yeah, but the E only appears in the second version of it, in the second bar. Sorry, because it's repeated. So yeah, so it really depends on whether you think the arpeggio was like completed. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, they would function similarly because they have all the same notes. The only difference is that the E7 flat 9 has an E as well. Yeah. Um, either think... way, what they're doing is they're functioning as a cadence into a new key. So this is why it works. So do, do we move to A then? Yeah, exactly. And oh, actually okay. the, the A chord that we hear, they heard afterwards, uh, has a 9 in it too. Interesting. Yeah. I think a lot of these things, people think of these extended chords as like the domain of jazz, but yeah. it's all in bar. It's just not all done to splat simultaneously, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's like a big difference. Like all of these really uh, extended well, chords. It sounds appear. like they're um, leading notes, but yeah. the leading notes yeah. are held such that you hear the extended harmonies for you know a crotch or something before moving on. Yeah, or sometimes they're just in there for color or whatever. But also because this is not just a chord pattern, it's also the melody. You have the other notes in there too. Yeah. Um, okay. What was I saying about it? That is interesting because you think if okay. you're going to do a pastiche of a um, baroque piece, you wouldn't put in these extended harmonies. You no, would try well, and keep it as yeah. diatonic as possible, but apparently that's not oh, the case. No, no, yeah, not at all. Like the the prelude in C, that pattern that goes up, the next chord is a D minor seven <laughs> because it's got the C in the bass, so it's like a D minor seven in uh, third inversion, like it's the next chord. You could think of it as like a slash chord, but well, yeah, it probably would be a slash chord if yeah. But you know, it's both. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this, okay, what am I saying? This is basically acting as a perfect cadence into a new key. Yeah. So even though the note is unexpected and not in D minor, the move to it is not a complete, like, what's going on? Because it's setting up a common key change into a related key. And A minor is a very closely related key to yeah. D minor. It's on the fifth position, the dominant position, and there's only one note's difference between the key. This is why these key changes work so well. Yeah. Because the, the tonic is far away enough that it sounds like you've actually gone somewhere, but the notes in the key are not that different. There's a lot of common chords. Also, moving to E isn't that unusual. I mean, moving to the second, or mm. the, when I say the major second, you, I mean, you know, the major chord on the second position of the mm. scale. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's too unusual as well. No, that's a yeah, that's what you call a secondary dominant chord. Yeah. So the dominant chords appear on the fifth position of your major scale, but then you can that's where they appear diatonically, but then you can put them on a different position, modulate to somewhere else, and that's a secondary dominant. Interesting. So it's a five of five. Yeah, that's what this is. But it doesn't have to be five of five. Any dominant seven you put that is modulating to a new key is a secondary dominant, but if you say secondary dominant, normally you're thinking of on the second position. Okay. Um, okay. So I've written, why does this musical device work? This works so well as a compositional device because it subverts the expectation of the listener, but it doesn't subvert them too much. The G sharp in the sequence is unexpected because it is chromatic to the key of D minor, but it is not completely random and unrelated as it is used to set up a key change to a closely connected key, A minor. If your music changes in such completely unconnected and unexpected ways as to not be at all followable, followable to the listener, it can make the music unsettling and difficult to listen to. Unless that's deliberately what you were going for, you should avoid it. <laughs> Did you? Oh, I see, yeah. yeah. I thought that was just like an opinion at the end of that. No. <laughs> just, no some... You should just avoid this in general. <laughs> no. Sometimes you want music to be unsettling. Yeah. But this is not what this is doing, is it? No, not at all. Um, on the other hand, if your music only does completely expected things that the listener can predict coming, that can become tedious and boring. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. We should probably mention this at some point. The complexity curves in music and what's interesting, what's not interesting. Yeah, and how well, very complex stuff isn't interesting, and very simple stuff also isn't interesting. There's a kind of sweet spot in the middle. Mm. Well, let me just. Um, there's a final paragraph here that kind of sums up what I was getting at. So music is best when it isn't completely predictable nor completely unpredictable. The listener needs to be able to follow your music, but not predict everywhere it is going to go. That's one of the key points here. So it's always the pieces of music that add inventive things that you didn't see coming that really grab your interest. Nothing in the music really stands out or does anything remotely unexpected. It won't get anybody's attention. Essentially just becomes background music. And this idea of just using is this descending sequence and then landing somewhere else. That's just something, if your piece is based on sequences, you could just remember that. Like, okay, you've got your pattern, but don't always just go to the, where I'm thinking you're going to go. So when that, sequence happens and we move down to the G sharp I can't quite remember does the G sharp happen out of nowhere and then the rest of the context is given kind yeah so that's a really interesting way of doing it yeah by setting up this unexpected note yeah it's almost like retconning the unexpectedness of it yeah and saying, like, oh actually it was actually in... don't worry yeah we're not going too far yeah that's one of... he also does it in the reverse in some pieces like this there's a sequence that goes up and then sort of falls short a semitone you hear that in some of his violin concertos do that. Okay. So it works both ways. But it's just a nice thing to remember. It's almost like playing a wrong note and then yeah. giving that wrong note, like you say, retconning it with context. Yeah. That's a really interesting yeah. compositional device. Yeah. And um, I have used this sort of thing, but you don't have to land on the same unexpected note. Like it doesn't have to be setting up a key change in the same way. I'll show an example, because I've got the guitar here. I've got a piece, it's E minor, and the, it's based on ascending arpeggios, and there's basically a melody in the bass line. So after playing it for a while, you know, so you get this sort of thing going on. Yeah. But then using this uh, device, like remembering that it's a useful thing to do, I don't land on the E, I land on the F natural. Okay, semi turn away. Yeah. And um, I'm really dry. I need to go get a drink after this. Want... Yes, please. <laughs> I want people listening to my... <sighs> Refreshing. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, so even... Though I am actually modulating to... I'm modulating to uh, the subdominant. Do I go from E minor to A minor? And the subdominant is... The fourth position of the scale. And it's another... Again, it's exactly as closely related in that it is one note's difference. Uh, between the key, but it's a different note. Yep. So if I'm in E minor, I could go to um, B minor, and yeah. E minor has one sharp, B minor has two. You can uh, also but, go to C. Yeah, well, um, C. Major. Yeah, well, that's a relative major of A minor. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so you go to A minor, there's just one fewer sharps. Yep. So now that it's all naturals. So you're, it's just going a different way around the circle of fifths. But what I've done, I don't go straight to like an E major into it. I land on an F natural acting as the sixth chord of the new key and then going down to the fifth. Okay. Let's have a but the sixth chord is also extended. I have a B natural in it, so it's acting like a sharp 11. So just so you hear what it sounds like. So now we're in A minor. Interesting. So, yeah. you, so you can see how I've kind of used this device, but used my own take on it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, and it's a different genre as well. So it's not yeah. limited to Baroque music. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm saying. You can write Spanishy sounding music like that, and you can use similar things. It just works with anything, even in a jazz piece, or you could be doing a solo. Oh, like, right. oh, you have like a bunch of scales coming down, but then just do something. I mean, this unexpected. is what I say all the time where you set up your two five one and when you hit one don't go to one go to the me go to the chord on the sharp one what do we call that in proper scale terminology oh, flat and supertonic or yeah so yeah. for example Depending if you're going to go it. if you're going to go d minus 7 g7 and then to c so your melody would end on yeah. c you can do a d flat major 7 yes because the major seventh note of that is the tonic. Yeah, it's a kind of so, flipped way of yeah, doing so, it. So it's like, ang yeah. Where the melody is expected, but the harmony isn't. So it's a kind of inverse of the, the Bach technique. Mm. But yeah, no, I mean, it still holds holds true. 
Okay, let's look at this other blog I've written. Do you feel like that's covered enough? Yeah. 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 Oh, I think just good technique. Oh, yeah. Uh, just a, another point to raise about that. The exact same thing happens in um, some screaming children outside. The technique doesn't happen in screaming children, sorry. <laughs> I love how they, they waited till they were just outside to scream, but walked silently up to there. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> really convenient. It's probably mm. not being picked up at all. No. Um, so we just look insane. We can cut this out. Yeah. I'm not going. Anyway, but this uh, this device happens in in the uh, cello suite as well. Yep. So also saying there's that similarity in the establishing the opening chords with the uh, pedal tonic note underneath. He also uses this device. There's like a descending melodic line lands on a note outside the key, setting up a key change. He does it in the same thing. Yeah. I have it right here. So I like the fact actually you have like a micro macro version of the yeah. same. I'll, I'll show it on the screen, but you can see at the end of bar 19, there's a completely diatonic uh, sequence going all the way down, and then yeah. just lands outside the key because it's setting up a key change. Now, yeah. when you were saying these uh, small melodic like repetitions, mm. you essentially have a what you're doing is you're setting up a structure, and then you're changing that structure slightly every time. So it's like a micro version mm. of that big sort of jump in expectation. Yeah. Another thing I've noticed to do with these sequences that Bach does a lot, you'll have something that repeats kind of like three times, and it's not necessarily that it'll do something chromatic, but the sequence tends to change after three times. Because four is like kind of the magic number in music, isn't it? It's like, oh, yeah, four beats and four chords and your repeated pattern. Yeah, It's just something he does a lot. The pattern will set up and it will do it three times and then do something else. So it's like, oh, I'm just about to get into it and then he's done something else. Yeah. So it, you can't just like float along mindlessly. It does make you actually sort of participate more. So that there, sense? he is setting up an expectation for the unexpected there. Kind of, yeah. If there, if it's always, or it's not. I mean, it's probably not always, but if it's largely a repetition of three and then something else. Yeah, you've... yeah. It's not always, but you, if you listen to a lot of his music, you'll hear that. I mean, obviously there are repetitions of four as well. I'm not saying this is what he always does, but it's just something he does a lot. I'm trying to think of an example, like, oh, I, I mean, uh, it's say in a film, you know, when there's a bit of dialogue going in a film and you just know what someone's going to say and it's just like, ugh, come on. <laughs> you know what my, my favorite one? A kick on. You probably know what this is. But when someone in a film or something, they say this in games a lot as well, someone will say, this is the end, right? And then someone else will go, no, this is the beginning. Ugh. <laughs> I shouldn't know that's coming, but you just do. Okay. Um, so if that would bark. Yeah, like he wouldn't say, this is just the beginning. He'd actually say something that he didn't expect. Like Pelican Hat. <laughs> no, because that's completely irrelevant. What I'm saying is, it works, but it's not exactly what you thought he was going to do. Okay? Uh, so, moving on to the next point. Yeah. My next blog. Okay. This is actually a very easy compositional device to understand. It is simply the use of a key change to a related key. Okay. Okay, well that isn't exactly uncommon, and certainly isn't unique to Bach. I hear you screaming at your computer monitor, and your rage would be justified. But hang on a second, there's more. This is a good blog. <laughs> yeah. What is so interesting about the ones we are looking at today is where they appear in the piece. You see, what Bach likes to do, or rather like to do, Rip in peace, brother. I actually wrote that. <laughs> All right, right at the very end of the piece, which has already travelled on an exciting harmonic journey through several different keys, and is clearly building up to a triumphant, jubilant and well-earned return to the home key, one that the listener deserves, nay needs, suddenly modulate somewhere else. And right in the very last bar, you can have your tonic key resolution. And relax. Yeah. All right, so, uh, again, referencing the prelude in C from the 48 Prelodes and fugues. Yep. It's exactly what happens. So you move through you move through loads of different keys. Uh, nor, more towards the end, he goes to the subdominant. So there's a C major, and then it becomes a C7. It takes you to F. There's more like chromatic development in there. No it's, F minor. No. Uh, not too common in Baroque music, actually. It's interesting. The, you do hear sometimes the uh, diminished... Uh, supertonic chord, which sounds very similar. Yeah, it does. Um, but I, I'm yet to notice any examples of the minor subdominant chord in any bark yet. But there is that one. That's another time. Um, we should do a whole podcast yeah. on the minor four. Yeah. 
So what, anyway, so what I'm saying about this, you, if you listen to the piece in its entirety, you'll hear this. It's clearly building right back up to the home key to like nicely finish off. As soon as it's about to get there, it just goes somewhere else again, and then back to the home key. It's just the old switcheroo. Okay, so do does he prep the return to the home key after doing the old switcheroo? Yeah, he does. Uh, like just to show you again. So after he's gone to F, there's these like a G. There's like a G sus chord, then G seven, and you can tell exactly where it's going. And then there's an F. And then back to C. Yeah. That's what I'm getting like. Just just throws it in there just to stop you actually following the piece all the way. <laughs> you could keep going. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. He Obviously, you expect that more in the middle of a piece when it's being developed. But that's what I was just saying. It's interesting that you see them doing this at the end of quite a lot of pieces. Um, why do you think that is? Well, let's look into it. Okay. By the way, a similar thing happened in the prelude to his lute suite, BWV 998. Uh, the arrangement I and most others would be familiar with is for guitar in the key of D major, a key which fits nicely on the guitar. So again, there is a great thematic development that goes through many different keys and a build-up back to the home key. This example is different in that the big build-up actually goes back to D, but once we are here, the D major keeps alternating with a D7, acting again as a perfect cadence and hinting at a related key, G major. This is happening all the way up until the penultimate bar even before Bach finally relents and lets us relax back on the tonic. I can put a link to a performance there and you'll hear, you'll hear exactly what I mean. So yeah, it goes right back. Oh, am I going somewhere else? No. Am I? No. Yes? No. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's exactly the same example I used for the last one, but it also works with the whole, you know, um, replacing the uh, using the melody to land yeah. on the flat yeah. two major yeah. seven chord. Yeah. Um, well, I've got a little summary here, so hopefully this will make clear exactly what I'm getting at. So, what exactly is the lesson here? Well, it isn't that you should change key right at the end of the piece. Not exactly, anyway. There's a bit more to it than that. Although changing key right at the very end is a perfectly good compositional tool, and want to stick in your composer toolbox. The lesson here is that you need to keep the listener on their toes and not give them exactly what they expect. In this example, what the listener expects is a return to the home key, but Bach subverts their expectations and the gratification at the climax is higher, even though it is delayed, actually because it is delayed. The postponement of resolution at the end is just one compositional technique to introduce variety and interest to your piece. And there are countless ways to do this, and how you do it is up to you. The key to great art is invention and creativity, you are unlikely to read in a guide to composition that it is important to change key right at the very end of your piece, and that's exactly the point. You have to be creative. Yeah. That's what I'm getting at. No one's going to say, oh, you must do that. But that, yeah, that's exactly it. So do you... something that someone wouldn't have told you to do. That makes your music different. Yeah. I mean, that's easier said than done. It is, but I mean, hopefully especially... this is the sort of thing that will help you actually get into that mindset. So do you have any examples of pieces that you've written that use this technique? Uh, no, just the last one. I don't copy them completely. <laughs> uh, so as I summed up last time, music is best when it isn't completely predictable nor completely unpredictable. I think that's a really key point. Yeah. It's the same thing with fiction as well. There's a lot of parallels. Like if everything in a film that happens is so formulaic, you've seen it a million times, you know exactly what's going to happen, boring. If just random stuff happens, so there's no internal logical consistency, it's not enjoyable in yeah. the same way. I mean, parallels between fiction and music don't exactly work because fiction actually has a real story and music is completely abstract, but you can still think of it in terms of making sense in a way that we can understand. Yeah, there, there's certainly, certainly something about expectation and subversion of expectation mm. in, in a lot of art. Jokes as well, common yeah. one. Um, yeah, there was one other thing I was going to mention before we wrap up. Nice, nice three. I think three things is a good amount to learn in one go. Yeah, you know we should have done four things, and then the fourth would be something kind of unexpected but related. <laughs> How to make creme brulee. <laughs> um, and I haven't written about this, so I'm just going to close the laptop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so completely freewheeling. Yeah, exactly. Now I was just going to mention. 
another commonality is just how he structures music. Okay, how do you mean? Uh, lots of his music, particularly instrumental music, is in binary form. Um, some of his most famous pieces, Air on the Air on the G String, is known. He didn't call it that, but the air from his orchestral suite in D. So by binary form, do you mean theme A, theme B, theme A, theme B? No, or... I just mean A, B. Okay. That's it. Well, generally each section is repeated. If the section isn't repeated, it's actually hard to say what constitutes the section. Because you might say, well, that sounds like A, but if you go straight into B, why isn't it just one piece just of music? A, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But generally he writes it. So A, A, B, B. Right, that's a really common one. Like saying the air. Oh, air does that, of course, yeah. Yeah, but what I'm getting at... Um, so he almost goes A, A, B, B there, doesn't he? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. But the interesting thing I've, I've noticed, and I'm not saying that this is uh, exclusive to Bach, I'm just saying, with all of these things, I'm not saying he necessarily invented these. It doesn't matter. They're just interesting, useful devices to have. Yeah. Uh, the B section is often twice the length of the A section. And I think there's a good reason for that, just psychologically. He wouldn't have necessarily thought about this when doing it, but how it plays into how we like repetition and variation. Yeah. You repeat your A section and you do it shorter because that means I'm sort of invested in the piece. And that means now I'm invested you can then extemporize and expand on your themes in a much longer way, but I'm less likely to tune out because I'm sort of already musically invested. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, you, the repetition is the hook. The quick repetition of the, is the hook, and then they stay for the longer sections, is yeah. what you're saying. Yes, exactly. Sorry, I was just getting some notes. Uh, so one of the pieces I mentioned earlier, the Loot Suite BWV998, Exact same thing, there's a third movement, just allegro. A section, 32 bars, B section, 64. Uh, the cello suite in G, there are two minuets in there, exactly the same thing. A section, eight bars, B section, 16. And it's exactly the same for both minuets. Um, I did read somewhere, oh, there was there was a book, and I can't remember the name of the book, I have to give it to you at the end, but they, there was something about Bach really liked um, certain numbers or certain numbers of bars, but it's not just the certain numbers; it's the relationship between the, the the two numbers. So there, you've got a one to two ratio. I think it was something to do with mm. religion. It's like the octave, isn't it? it? Yes, it was because they thought that the the harmonic series had something to do with the divine. Yeah. If you were approximating the harmonic series, yeah. I mean, there's a wrong way of thinking about it in terms of like, oh, I have to mirror this natural phenomenon. You don't necessarily have to, but it does tap into this sort of ordered structure i mean you'll see a lot of bark pieces uh, like that in length so the first section will be an equal number of bars and the next one will be a simple ratio mm. in length to the yeah. other one yeah um, hey, so sorry that's a yeah the air or in the famous air on the g string it's only the foot the a section is only six bars really yeah and then the b section is 12 but because it's so slow and it's written in semi-quavers and stuff it, but done at a slow tempo it's, it's quite long it's about four or five minutes if you listen to the whole thing with repeats there's famous Bore in E minor, that a lot of people know. That's uh, exact same structure, eight bars, B section, uh, 16. Anyway, I, I, uh, there's an interesting bit of information. This is John Powell's book, Why We Love Music. This is not John Powell, the film composer, as he points out in the book, much to the <laughs> disappointment of people who turn up to his lectures. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty good book if you're interested in music psychology. It's not stuff for your academic at all. It's like full of funny quips. It's not a very serious book, yep. but it has got a lot of information in it, so it's pretty good. And there's a chapter on repetition, surprises, and goosebumps. Um, where exactly is it? So there's a lot of repetition in almost every genre of music. And I'm just going to read this to you because it's pretty interesting. Sure. You'll have noticed that I said almost every genre. The exceptions are rare and usually involve intellectual modern classical composers deliberately trying to avoid repetition at all costs. To investigate our addiction to musical repetition, musical psychologist Elizabeth Margulis played recorded excerpts from little-known pieces of this sort of non-repeating music to a roomful of professional music theorists, people who could be expected to be well disposed to new musical ideas such as the avoidance of repetition. Dr. Margulis played some of the excerpts in her in their original no, repet, no repetition versions, but without telling the audience. She also tampered with some of the pieces, adding repeats of short sections of the music. For example, if the composer had written a piece made up of three segments intended to be played in the order one, two, three, 
the audience heard the music with the first and third segments repeated like this, one, one, two, three, three. Sorry, I'm still really dry. Sorry if I'm making, I finished that. Anyway, if I'm making lots of, you just kind of grin and bear it. Yep. Okay. The audience members were then asked how much they enjoyed the various pieces of music and the results showed that they much preferred the pieces that included the repeats. As Dr. Margulis says in her fascinating book On Repeat, this is a stunning finding, particularly as the original versions were crafted by internationally renowned composers and the preferred repeated versions were created by brute stimulus manipulation without regard to artistic quality. <laughs> uh, so not only do we love repetition in music, but we also get less enjoyment out of music that doesn't involve repetition. I think that's a really interesting point that yeah. the only thing they've done is just you hear it again and you like it more. I think it's un you, it's very unusual nowadays to hear for example, A, A, B, B, even with the repetition of the individual segments, you'd expect to hear A, B, A, a return to the yeah, original that's theme. rounded by, that's another common one. Yeah. But, um, whether or not it goes back to the original, I was just making the point that it's often better to have your longer, more elaborate sections after an initial repetition, because uh, there there is a quote, actually, I think it was on that page. This is what I was getting at, I forgot to read it. Um, Okay, as psychologist Peter Kivy puts it, musical repeats allow us to grope so that we can grasp. I think that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, interesting. Like that is why music repeats. Because if it's just a continuous stream of notes, there's like no information I can really discern from it. It's just almost random. But just simply repeating it, it's like now not random at all. Yeah. Uh, in a way, if you yeah. know what I mean. Well, we like finding patterns, don't we? As yes. humans. So it really nicely ties into human psychology um i'm not saying bach considered this but great musicians naturally intuit what ties into our psychology and then we work it out with psychology if that makes yeah. sense i mean that's true of a lot of music just music theory isn't it mm. you intuit it and then later you work out why you did that yeah um yeah same with like learning cool new chord patterns sometimes you just play stuff it's like, oh, that was nice. What did I do? You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. Those are the three things. So it was the uh, descending patterns and uh, landing on notes that aren't expected. Just key changes when they aren't expected, especially right at the end. Because that's the last place you expect them to put them. Like, we're just about to finish. What are you doing? Okay, we're finished <laughs> now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, like, driving on the way back from a holiday, just quickly pop to Disneyland, then home, you know? And then just thinking about the structure of your piece. Um, I mean, they're all themed around repetition here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I don't think any of this is particular to Baroque or classical music at all. I think this could apply to any style. Do you agree yeah. with that? No, yeah, completely. And I think actually, especially the last one, helps with longer form pieces. Mm. Yeah, it's just a way of thinking about it. Just be conscious of the structure of your piece and how people uh, will be able to actually get on board with the music as it's happening. Yeah, I think um, shorter pieces, so two minutes, three minutes, they benefit from the fact that the listener can repeat them multiple times and put in their own repetition. Whereas if you're con constructing larger works, this yeah. is really useful. Yeah. It's just making it more engaging. Mm. Uh, that's basically all the points, I think. My but toolbox is fuller. Yeah, it's full up for today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're trying out some composing, just think about these things we'll do other episodes we'll have to pick some other yeah, we should. there's some stuff from jazz i think we should definitely mention yeah if you want to do one yeah uh next episode is going to be our equal temperament we touched on some of this stuff didn't we in the one yeah bit. but we're going to really explore what it is and why we do it uh so not one that's actually going to help people with composing but if you're just interested in music you should find it interesting yeah okay that's that's it, it the spectralists What's that? That's time for next time. The spectralists, spectralism, where you said it wouldn't help with your composition, but there is a oh, type of music where they tune to the frequencies. Anyway, that's oh, for next week. Wow. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you. You're gonna say goodbye. 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 <laughs> <laughs>